Joining us right now is the former White House Chief of Staff under President Obama and former Commerce Secretary under President Clinton, Bill Daly. Bill, it's good to see you. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Thanks so Maria. much for joining us. Well, wow, never a dull moment. No. D does this stuff get in the way, you think, of actually getting a deal done and the, and the issues at hand like an immigration reform package? I don't think there's any doubt that they do. You cannot dismiss the president's comments as explosive as they were in the middle of a negotiation session down to the wire. The president the other day called the meeting of a bipartisan meeting at the White House, did a pretty good job of expressing he wanted to be for whatever they wanted to be. And it was about love and solving right. the different problems and, and showed a real, in some ways, as best maybe he can, an empathy for the difficulty, not only the DACA students uh, or DACA uh, people in, in the U.S., but the overall issue of immigration and the challenges of it. Then you blow it up with this at a moment where there seemed to be, at least amongst some bipartisan, an agreement uh, on, on a deal. So I, I think it's, it's really, I don't know what the negotiating strategy is when there seemed to have been progress to then walk in and try to blow the thing up. Even even when most participants in the room have said in the past that we need structure and security at the borders. I mean, you were well, there, president. No question. He felt that way. President Clinton, President Obama, we put billions and billions of dollars on that border. It is difficult. There's no doubt. And there is an, a, an activist I've met who's on the other side about a comprehensive immigration reform package that doesn't agree that security must be at the right. top of it. Right. Whether it's a wall, whether it's some other form. Even Sarah uh, Sanders spoke the other day about a broader, possible broader uh, solution to the difficulties of security at the border. So it's not just a wall. The president has made it about the wall. So I think there's a sense of we have to solve this problem. Remember, on the DACA issue, mm -hmm. It's the president's decision to repeal what Obama did that created the crisis for those 800,000 people today. It was not a crisis until the president decided to repeal what Obama did for those DACA uh, Because he uh, felt that what Obama did was, was not legal. Right. Fine. But the courts hadn't held that. So yeah. he, he took the step that caused this crisis. The, the name calling, though, you know, getting in the way in terms of moving forward in progress, right. it does go both ways, Bill. I mean, listen to Nancy Pelosi calling the tax plan Armageddon. I mean, right. it, it's, it's I, ridiculous. Oh, I think the rhetoric. You know? I, and I, then yesterday she says five white guys are running the, the, right. the, the tax plan. Right. They should open a hamburger stand. I mean, right. what? what? I oh, mean, there's no question our politics has become a rather coarse. Right. And the rhetoric, all, but when the commander in chief, the president, the person who's the leader of the country in the world, talks about people from other parts of the world in such a derisive and such a seemingly racist way, let's be honest here, that resonates. You go to Africa where China is investing tremendous amount of resources yeah. and political resources to move Africans. We have men and women in the military. We have men and women in the private sector around the world. And we are insulting the commander in chief, the president, not some politician mm. at a lower level, is insulting people from other parts of the world. That, that affects our country and affects possibly affects our men and women who are in the military. So there's the, there, there's the comments <clears throat> and, and sort of the off the cuff comments and then there's his policies. Right. The policies seem to be very different. I mean, you look at what he's done in terms of the tough talk with North Korea. You look at the situation right now with uh, ISIS, and then there's Iran, the Iran nuclear deal. Now, the right. president will reportedly extend the sanctions relief to the country um, uh, and keep the nuclear agreement intact for the next several months, according to the Wall Street Journal this morning. The journal is also reporting that the spark behind the protest in Iran is due to part of to financial firms that actually defrauded investors. Are you surprised by this? What's your take on what has taken place in Iran? Well, I think there's a yearning, especially when you consider how young that population is in Iran, for more freedoms. That is what They've I think is empowered. driving that. They've right. become empowered. Yeah. Obviously, social media is a tremendous addition. They've lived under a authoritarian uh, religious uh, government for now almost 40 years. And, and so I think there's a yearning by the young people to change their system. That's, we've seen this in history. Yeah. There's nothing new about this, and we ought to encourage that. Well, well, well there's also, Obviously. what's new is he has really formed, President Trump has formed an alliance with the Crown Prince and the King of Saudi Arabia, right. uh, and they're doing this corruption crackdown, and it seems to have empowered others in the Middle East. That's well, what I'm saying I, about policy versus personality. Yeah, but, but you cannot separate the 
person who's the leader of the United States, the leader of the free world, uh, and, and how he's viewed, and therefore how the U.S. is viewed, you can't just uh, think that there's a total wall between that and the policies. Right. They do bleed over. So the policies around immigration and what he stands for gets clouded enormously by the rhetoric that he used last night. Yeah. You have to wonder what's his real motivation here when you see or you hear him speak like that and then you see certain policies that people already interpret as being difficult on these countries. So I, I, I think it's it's unrealistic to think that you can uh, switch this light off and just deal with policy and then separate the rhetoric and say, well, that's just it's his a fair talking. Point. It's a fair that's, point. You, you know, people get insulted. Yeah. They don't necessarily, like, you know, maybe in a business deal, and when, when the president used to do business deals, you'd be tough, you'd be insulting, and then you walk in and say, oh, don't worry about that. I didn't really mean it. Let's do a deal. Well, a lot of people don't respond well to that. They say, wait a minute, there's something beyond that. I'm, in, I'm insulted. I'm insulted. Yeah. This is personal. And don't expect me to do what you need me to do after you've treated me this way. You, you went to Davos with President Clinton. Right. Um, in his last, this was his last year. Last year, year 2000. The, 2000. What, what's your take on, on President Trump now taking a huge uh, uh, posse of people, right. six cabinet secretaries? He's going to have a big presence. The U.S. will have a big presence in this gathering of global leaders. Yeah, it's a gab fest for type A's from around the world. Yes, world leaders show up. President Clinton, last year President Xi. The real question is, what's the point of this? Is it just to hang out with a bunch of wealthy fat cats in, in Davos, of which everybody who's there, if you qualify to get there, you are that? Or what's the message that he's telling the world? We're engaged. We believe in trade. If you listen to Xi's comments last year, they were very different than the sort of message President Trump has delivered uh, in the U.S. and in the few places he's gone around but, the world. But why wouldn't he go? I mean, why wouldn't he go where there are other major world leaders there? He needs many of these. These leaders yeah, but to, he can in, in his fight against North Korea, in his fight yeah, against but, ISIS, but, why not go to, to have bilateral meetings with some of these he, other leaders? He, What's he, wrong with it? He can go any place in the world, seemingly, or he can meet and talk to anybody in the world. He doesn't have to go to Davos to get to talk to, name the leader of the world you want to talk to. I was thinking, and a five-minute or ten-minute bilat yeah. in Davos in a little room off the side of the well, hall. Well, let me, let me say this, because I, I, I was speaking to a leading investment guy yesterday, and he said to me, Maria, what I'm hearing right now, our leaders in Europe are rethinking how they allocate money because of the U.S.'s tax plan. They're saying, okay, we've been sending all of this money here. We're going to redirect and send money to the U.S. because of the tax plan. So the president is trying to export his ideas in terms of economic policy with this tax plan by speaking to the rest of the world so that international money comes to the U.S. Look, and you know what? It seems to be working. I, I think it is good for the president, any president, to speak to the world about the U.S. strength, economic strength strength, political strength, our values. And he do, obviously does not have to go to Davos. I don't think there's a negative to going to right. Davos other than the time and the effort and the image of a president who holds himself out as the ultimate populist right. hanging out with a bunch of fat cats uh, who uh, enjoy three days in Davos. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, we'll, we'll be watching, and obviously we're going on this program, yeah. so we'll cover it. Bill, it's great to great. see you. Thanks, Maria. Always a pleasure. Thank Bill Daly there.